Hello, welcome to On Point. I'm Sofia Gutierrez. Straws, trash bags, and water bottles. These are just a few things made out of plastic that are often only used once and then tossed out. According to Oceans Unite, 8 million tons of plastic enter the ocean each year. Countless numbers of marine animals and birds are affected by plastic pollution. They can easily get tangled in plastic products and choke on straws. Ocean Crusaders say that 100,000 marine creatures die each year due to plastic. Beach cleanups reduce the amount of plastic that ends up on our beaches, but that's not enough. And California is one of many states that has been taking steps to fix the problem of single-use plastic by trying to change people's habits. California has prohibited restaurants from giving out plastic straws to customers unless they request one. Many restaurants have opted to give out paper straws instead, and environmentalists have found other options, including metal straws and glass straws. Beach cleanup participant Sarah Vafi and CSUN's Catherine Scafidi say there's a lot of things people can do. In any way you could contribute, like cleaning up trash on the beach, or um, not using plastic water bottles, or using reusable utensils, like these are small ways that you can contribute to giving back to the earth. Um, one thing that I'm passionate about is eliminating plastic straws. So using um, recycled paper straws or metal straws or bamboo straws, there's a ton of alternative options. If you can get a big enough group of single individuals, you can affect change and then you can actually, you know, educate yourselves on why that's important and then that can kind of ripple up to legislature and the people that are in office and can you know enforce the policies to um, you know sure it's a straw but then that could be like the bag band and you know we can start going after styrofoam and thinking of alternative things that we can use and like you know plant-based material or things that can decompose in 2014, Governor Jerry Brown signed a law banning single-use plastic bags at places like grocery stores. By 2020, a state law will ban the sale of personal care products that include plastic microbeads. Many companies, including Starbucks, have also joined in on the movement. Starbucks has been working toward getting rid of plastic straws in stores worldwide by 2020. Starbucks now offers recyclable lids to all customers. Still, many people question the ban on plastic straws, saying it won't make a difference. Others argue that hospital patients and those with disabilities can't use paper or metal straws. But a lot of people think this is the last straw and it's time to focus on waste management and sustainability. On Point, Claudia Flores has more on the story. Thank you, Sofia. Today we are joined by Sarah Johnson, who is CSUN Sustainability Program Analyst Nikhil Schneider, who is the Energy and Sustainability Coordinator here at CSUN, and Sheila Moravati, who is the founder of the organization HabitsOfWaste.org. Thank you for joining us. And let's get right to the point. What is single-use plastic and why are we talking about it? Sarah, would you like to say something? So single-use plastic is plastic that takes a lot of resources to make and never really goes away. Um, it stays in the environment pretty, you know, for hundreds or thousands of years, but we use it for such a short amount of time. So if you think of a plastic water bottle or a straw or a fork, you use it for you know one meal or one drink, and then you throw it in the trash or it gets recycled. Um, but it uses a lot of resources to make, um, and then it still um, stays in our environment for a really long time and has a lot of environmental impact. Whereas if you have a reusable item, um, then you can use it over and over again. Nico, would you like to say something? Um, yeah, I, I would add that we're talking about it because it's such a massive environmental concern, both from a, a resource consumption standpoint and a pollution standpoint. Um, most of the pollution in our environment is single-use plastic. Uh, Sheila? I'd just add that um, single-use plastics times the number of people there are on this planet, it just accumulates in such a massive way. So for example, plastic cutlery, in America we use 40 billion pieces of plastic cutlery per year. And just imagine 40 billion pieces of plastic cutlery never leaving the planet and it's gotta go somewhere. So it ends up in our waterways, back in our ocean, and then it destroys our sea life and uh, our planet. Sheila, I understand you played an integral role in banning the plastic straws in Malibu. Um, did you did you know that it would have such an impact as it did? Did you face any challenges? 
I think um, the Malibu straw ban was something that at the time we just knew it was the right thing to do. The city also knew it was the right thing to do, and they were really work working. To, we were working together to come up with a very strong ban that would make sense for the city and the beaches that um, are right there. But what we didn't expect was the firestorm of um, following the, the firestorm following that with all the different countries and cities who also banned plastic straws and cutlery and single-use plastics like that. We were really surprised to see the response after Malibu passed the ban. Nico and um, Sarah, what does the Institute of Sustainability do here at CSUN? So the Institute is a university-wide department, so we don't fall under any college, and basically our mission is to um, promote sustainability on campus and in the greater community, and so because we're um, not an academic department, we don't offer courses, but we work very closely with faculty who teach courses related to sustainability and then all disciplines, um, and then we also provide educational opportunities for students related to sustainability through service learning, so we have a garden, so students can come out um, and learn you know, what what broccoli looks like, how to grow a carrot, how to grow a tomato, um, how to compost, so kind of closing that loop on food. Um, and then we also, um, right now, compost our pre-consumer food waste, so all of the food, the kitchen scraps from um, the dining locations on campus, and so that actually has a large oppor educational opportunity for students related to plastic because all of the produce that we buy has those little plastic stickers on them. And so while the food is compostable and can break down and turn into this nutrient-rich soil, all of those plastic stickers are what we're left with. So we actually have student volunteers who are picking up all that micro trash, all of those plastics um, you know, that get left behind um, in the environment when all of the food gets broken down. I think Sarah's answer was pretty comprehensive. Um, I would add that the Institute was really the first, um, first sustainability related organization on campus and has, has um, strengthened and really grown the, uh, the sustainability program. The sustainability plan came out of the Institute, which has really expanded CSUN's efforts um, for sustainability. And the Institute has been instrumental in driving sustainability research as well as creating student um, educational and service learning opportunities. Sheila, what are some simple things that people can do to avoid plastic? Oh, there's so many. Um, I think partly it would be like we brought today our own water bottles, um, thinking ahead. Some of our my friends are now really starting to make a difference in just getting to-go containers, just bringing along your own containers to, to take your food to go. That's a huge issue right there. Um, once again, maybe not using a, a straw is a really simple thing to do and you might not even need that straw when you're drinking your drink you can actually put the drink cup to your lips um, or if you maybe could bring your own metal straw or something like that really um, bring your own BYO is the big motto I think more than anything and just thinking ahead so if you're going out you know I'm gonna need to get something to go or pick up maybe bring your own things that would be my biggest suggestion can you explain what your organization means by call to action and what way is it guiding people to make their own difference in the world? Partly because, you know, we have to cut single-use plastic at the tap. So one of the biggest messages we're trying to put out is refusal. So if people, you know, single-use plastics are really not recyclable. They're just too light. They won't be, they won't go into a recycling facility. In fact, only 9% of our plastic usage is being recycled at this point. Some argue that that number is even less now that China will no longer accept our plastics. So the truth is we really do need to refuse plastic and start thinking differently about what we need and how we are going to change our own behaviors. So habitsofwaste.org is there to be a resource for people to find ways and opportunities to make a shift in behavior. One of the things that we actually did was ask people to download a letter to send to Uber Eats, for example, so that Uber Eats will change the functionality on their application to give people an opportunity to opt out of plastic cutlery if they are going to eat at home, for example. So those are simple functions that are just system errors or um, not really just working toward giving human beings a chance to make the choice. So those are some of the other things that we try to do is create opportunities to make the right choice. And uh, Nikhil, how has CISA done its part to reduce waste? I know we have reusable straw, I mean plastic straws at this food intensive. What other ways has CISA done to reduce waste? 
So uh, CSUN dining, as, as Sheila mentioned, a massive portion of uh, single-use plastic is associated with food waste and CSUN, or with food packaging, rather. Uh, and CSUN dining has been a very um, willing partner in terms of converting as much of their to-go ware as possible to compostable. Um, we're still working on ways to make it reusable um, because obviously a compostable utensil is still single use, um, but at least it's uh, being composted. And so clamshell containers, um, flatware, straws, coffee cups from our um, main dining commons on campus, the Sierra Center, um, the vast majority of the, the food packaging items in, in that facility are compostable. Um, the exception would be um, processed food like chips and candy and things like that. Um, I understand other countries in Europe are using bioplastics. Can you explain what they are and should Americans read more into it? So bioplastics are derived from um, plant, plant material for the most part, um, predominantly corn. Um, and Bioplastics function very similar to plastics in most ways. Um, they will not break down in the environment. They only really can be composted in industrial facilities with very high temperatures. Um, so unless those facilities exist in your area, bioplastics are not really a solution um, to single-use plastics. Um, and you could argue that they, pr they create another problem at the same time because now we're using um, food materials, you know, items that could be food um, to produce plastics as well. Um, Americans should definitely, you know, become more educated, um, but I think it's, you know, it, it's a, a very complicated topic. You know, it's not super cut and dried in terms of what what compostable plastics are, what bioplastics are, and how they compare. Um, and a lot of bioplastics look identical to traditional plastics, making it very difficult for consumers to know how to properly dispose of them. Um, so it's definitely it kind of muddies the waters and, and makes the education aspect of waste a little bit more difficult. Sheila, would you have anything to say to that? Yeah, sometimes restaurants want to make um, make a right decision or try to help out, and they're paying more money toward these compostables. And unfortunately, the compostables, just like um, Nikhil said, they behave the same in the environment. So it will not just disintegrate like many people think because it's made of corn. It just seems to be like maybe it would turn into food or something, but it doesn't. It really does need to go into um, an industrial composting facility where it warms the temperature up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. The, ch the challenge is, A, there aren't many of these around us, and B, the waste haulers are not willing to risk their compost for something that looks like plastic. So the challenge there is, once again, how do we um, go around this design flaw once more. So we've really tried hard to tell restaurant partners and everything, you know, it's much better to just go with a, maybe a paper product or bamboo product, even though, again, they're so expensive. Um, it, it really, compostables are not the answer, in my opinion. I know you talked about uh, papers, like, you know how they use paper straws now? Many people have complained about the use of these straws because they dissolve. What would be the solution for paper straws, or is there something more, do you think? There is one brand that I've heard of that lasts for three hours in a drink, and they've tested that one out, and that's also available on our website that you can, you know, order those. There are stronger ones. It's just more expensive, once again. So um, when, my recommendation is if you can, bring your own metal straw if you're really into metal. There's glass ones. There's even ones made out of pasta interesting things are out there now, uh, silicone straws, so I would recommend trying out a few other options. Paper straws that are flimsy that way do frustrate many people, I know, um, but personally I don't even need a straw, so I don't have this problem, <laughs> so I, I understand though that why, why someone would get annoyed with that. Uh, Sarah, do you know what are microplastics and why are they a problem? So the problem with plastic is it doesn't completely disintegrate. It just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces. And so if you take the ocean, for example, then the plastic just goes into the ocean and then from the UV from the sun, it breaks down into smaller pieces. And then if you think of even the health impacts for humans, so then, you know, you think tiny um, organisms in the ocean then eat, get, when they go to eat a fish, they also eat this plastic and ingest it. And then, you know, it goes up the food chain. So then larger fish then also are ingesting this plastic and it accumulates within their system. And then, so for humans, when we eat, fish, um, then we're also eating that plastic. And so um, the problem with it is that it just keeps accumulating in the environment. If, when we say, you know, we're, it's going away, it doesn't ever go away. You know, we have this um, finite planet and we're creating pl 
you know, all this plastic that just continues to accumulate in the environment. So it never goes away, it just breaks down into smaller pieces, making it even much more difficult for us to try to clean up or do something with. A lot of people use plastic straws for different issues. Some people are germaphobes, some people use it in the hospital. What would you say to the people who say that the ban is pointless? Uh, Sarah, would you like to answer? Yeah, um, it was interesting after the Malibu straw ban, people started asking me, so you've banned plastic straws in Malibu, what about the plastic water bottles? And what about the plastic cups? And that was my point. I said, yes, what about those? The conversation had started. This is the tip of the iceberg. So there's definitely, um, in my opinion, it is not pointless. I think the conversation about plastic has grown tremendously since the plastic straw bans are coming through. That is the easiest thing to give up, um, you know, as a, as a human being on this planet and to start to think differently. And I think that's the most important part is the power of one and how we could each start looking inwards and saying, what can I do differently? What's the habits that I'm addicted to or I think I am? And then realizing, oh, it's not so bad after all if I don't use, you know, this such and such plastic item. Um, Nick, uh, what happens to plastic when it's not recycled? Um, well, when it's not recycled, it either goes to a landfill where it you know, just sits there for hundreds of years. Um, maybe it goes to an incinerator where it's burned to create energy, um, releasing chemicals into the atmosphere. Um, or it goes into our environment. You know, maybe it was removed from a bin by a squirrel trying to get some of the residue out of like the coffee cup. Uh, maybe it blew out of the back of a, a waste hauling truck or something like that. But once in the environment, it's going to just break down into smaller pieces. Um, you know, or it could be ingested by wildlife. Um, you know, this pr particularly a problem in the ocean. And LA is a coastal city. Um, all the rain that falls on Los Angeles flows into our storm drain, which drains into the ocean. So any plastic pollution in our you know, gutters and our streets is going to drain into the ocean during rain events. Sarah, wh what happens when it's recycled? Well, so plastic still isn't like necessarily a high quality material, and so when it gets recycled, it can't keep perpetually, it's not a circular product where it can be um, recycled and create a similar product, it's always degrading. So even if it's something that's being recycled, like Sheila mentioned, it's only 9% or probably less, I would say, that's actually being recycled. And then it's turned into a lower quality product. So even, so recycling definitely isn't an answer because even if it does get recycled, like I said, it's a, such a small percentage, and then it turns into a less, a lower quality product, and then that product most likely can't be recycled. So it's still a very finite process. There's an awful a lot of plastic in this world, and there's an island of plastic floating in the ocean, and whales are being found with plastic in their bellies. Is banning straws enough? Sheila, would you like to answer? You know, sometimes um, the circumstance, once again, for humans to have a choice is the issue. One of the things that we learned was we wanted to speak with some of the students in the inner city of Los Angeles to try and engage them in making them make a difference and take a shift from their plastic water bottle dependency into more reusables. And we learned that they actually have to use plastic water bottles because there's no clean water at their school. And this is at LAUSD in Los Angeles, California. The reason was that their water fountains were dilapidated and old, and so no one was going to drink that, and no one did drink that. The water fountains were, you know, disgusting, really. And so we worked with the students on this program that we started called LA Green Teen in order to really educate the students about environmental justice and it's not just about um, making a choice it's about the infrastructure around us so it's not only about straws and about plastic water bottles it's about what access do we have to get off of plastic so right now um, Habits of Waste is really proud to be on the mission with the students at LA High to bring in all brand new uh, filter water filtration systems and that way the kids can start refilling water bottles and not having this dependency the school's asking the kids to drink 64 ounces of water per day. Each bottle has eight ounces, so that's eight bottles per kid at a dollar each, and most of them can't even afford it. So especially the athletes are being dehydrated, or they have to pay and have all these water bottles. So that school alone was almost at two million water bottles a year. So this is kind of like staggering numbers, but this is the reality that the circumstance sometimes has to be remedied in order to make the right choices away from plastic. Yeah. Since the commencement of the 10-year sustainability plan here at CSUN, what noticeable changes have we seen here on campus? Sarah? I mean, honestly, there's so many. I've I actually just celebrated my 10-year anniversary at CSUN, and 
you know, when I first started here, we didn't have water bottle refill stations, we didn't have a transit station, we didn't have compostable materials in the dining location. So um, I, the plan is very comprehensive. We cover 10 different areas um, across campus from administration and water and waste and academics, purchasing. Um, so there's all these different areas. Most of them encompass waste in some way. Um, I think purchasing is probably one of the um, biggest impacts I've seen um, a change, like mainly like I was saying with the compostable materials. Um, and then also installing the reuse the refillable um or the um, water bottle refill stations. Um, so encouraging students, so you know we still do sell bottled water on campus, but it's definitely been a culture shift. I see it's very common now to see students carrying their reusable water bottles. Um, and so I think it's just educating students. You know, I think one thing that I actually find refreshing working on a college campus is every year we have you know, 10, six to 10,000 new students that we can educate. And so you're constantly have this new audience of students that you can educate and inspire. Um, and so then they, students that are here today didn't know that CSUN never didn't used to have water bottle refill stations that's just what they know of the campus so it's this culture shift towards sustainability and so I um, mean you know, now you can go into the dining locations and bring your reusable cup and get a discount that wasn't always the case we sell uh, reusable straws now um, and so we have all of these things that now just seem normal on campus that you know even five or ten years ago weren't weren't happening and so um, I think we're just going to continue to see that progression with all of our goals towards zero waste um, and implementing finishing up the sustainability plan Nico? Would you like to add? Um, I, yeah, I would add we've, we've made uh, pretty impressive strides in terms of utility efficiency. Um, we're using less electricity and natural gas than we were 30 years ago, even having grown the campus tremendously in that time. Um, we're, we've removed over a quarter million square feet of turf grass, so we're saving over 55 million gallons of water, um, or we have saved over 55 million gallons of water since 2013. Um, which represents uh, like one and a half million dollars in savings. Um, so we're using less water than ever before. Um, we're becoming more and more energy efficient. Um, and hopefully we'll see um, this, a similar trend with our waste stream as well with that continuing to, to be reduced. And what about the fines? Do you think they're enough to stop restaurants from getting straws, Sheila? Well, um, since AB 140 has passed, I think that that's going to help a lot. There's so many restaurants that I've been to where they are, again, passing out the plastic water or the full glasses of water with the straw in each one that no one asked for. They did this because if in case someone did want the straw, they wouldn't have to go back and get it inside. So I do think that now those restaurants that I'm going to no longer have those straws present, and I'm really happy to see that. So I do think that that kind of new mindset, uh, which at Habits of Waste we like to call finding eco-normal, is working and um, and so I do think that the government and the fines and all of that is helping as well to get people kind of aware and willing to make the shift and the change. And what are some of the volunteer opportunities at the sustainability for students here? So I mentioned the garden, that's probably the one that students um, enjoy the most or is the most common, but the Institute um, also hosts events every year. And so in the fall, we always do sustainability day. And then in the spring, we always do water day. So it's a full day of speakers and films and topics um, related to different areas and themes. And so students are, we always want students to help us, um, you know, plan the event, um, to be there for the day of, take photos. Um, so a lot of different opportunities. We also have a lot of research projects. So we do surveys um, throughout the year for like related to commuting or um, culture related to sustainability and so we're always looking for students that are interested in getting research experience to help us with data analysis and report writing. Um, we also have social media and a newsletter that we publish so any students that are interested in marketing or um, journalism we're always looking for those type of students as well to help educate um, students because you know we can c try to come up with messaging to students but obviously students coming up with messaging to um, relate to students is always more effective um, so we have pretty much any we've had students from engineering and um, photography, art, psychology, you know, literally um, you know, every department volunteer with us and get some meaningful experience from it. Okay. Um, so my department uh, struggles a little bit to create student volunteer opportunities, but we have had um, many student projects that which we've worked on through different classes. Um, we've had students create a waste education program, so a peer-to-peer -peer program called Trash Talkers on um, how to you know, educate their peers on properly disposing of different waste materials. Um, we've also worked with students in a sustainability course to do a lighting inventory. So we have seven and a half million square feet of buildings on our campus, most of which is not lit as efficiently as it could be. Um, so that's one of our biggest areas of opportunity in terms of reducing our energy consumption. Um, but it also takes a lot of time to figure out, you know, what infrastructure we have in place and then what savings we could realize by um, 
you know, retrofitting it and improving it. Um, so these students looked at five different buildings and came up with um, projects and different scenarios for uh, making that lighting more efficient. Um, we've also had students map different features on campus. So we've had, um, we have almost a complete inventory of over 4,000 of our campus trees, um, including their location, species, health, and things like that, which has helped tremendously with the maintenance of our trees. Um, we've had students map all of our irrigation infrastructure. Actually, we're in the third phase of mapping our, our irrigation infrastructure, um, which has made it very easy for the ground shop to um, identify issues. Um, we can use data from our irrigation controllers to look at different areas of campus and their water consumption, um, which can further you know, drive our irrigation efficiency projects. Uh, and then most recently, we had students map all of our outdoor waste bins. Um, which will help a lot whenever we um, convert those bins to add recycling and composting in all of our outdoor spaces. Uh, and they also looked at whether or not rainwater could enter our bins since that represents a major source of pollution. Um, so that'll help tremendously whenever we're looking at um, complying with new stormwater pollution mandates, adding lids to our exterior bins and things like that. And how do you rally people to the cause when there's people who don't believe it, it's true, or think it's too big of a problem? Sheila? We believe in the power of one. Um, we don't think that it's fun to do anything when you feel like this is a huge mountain to move, but if you just take one step at a time, one individual at a time, the impact can be huge because, you know, if six billion people said, I'm going to use a plastic water bottle today, or I'm not going to use a plastic water bottle today, imagine the impact. And each and every one of us counts, and each and every one of us matters. And um, we invite the students at CSUN and everywhere else to reach out to us for intern opportunities, for uh, volunteer opportunities. We also really do want to um, open our, our, our doors to, to your community and, and look for the help, too. Rachel, would you like to add? Um, yeah, I would add that if individual actions didn't matter, then we wouldn't be facing the issues that we're facing today. Um, you know, you don't have to be the person who can fit one year's worth of waste in a jar, but um, you know, you shouldn't be the person using a, a brand new plastic fork at every single meal. Um, you know, you have hundreds of opportunities every day to do better than you are doing, um, and just being aware of those and, and choosing which ones you're willing to um, to realize um, goes a very long way. Sarah. Yeah, I would just add to that that it's about progress and not perfection. I mean, I would consider myself a very sustainable person, and there's still some times where I get caught at a restaurant and I forgot my reusable fork, and you know, you have to use that plastic fork, and I take it home, and I feel guilty, and I wash it. Um, so, but so j it's not an all or nothing thing. It's not like, oh, I have to become vegan, and I have to bring my reusable water bottle everywhere. It's small steps make a big impact. And so if everyone has that mindset and that mentality and do a, it's a progressive shift, then it will make a big difference. Um, you know, they say 500 million straws per day are used um, that end up in the trash can every single day. And so if you think every 500 million people say, oh, it's just one straw times 500 million, um, if everyone sh said, you know, refuse that straw that day, that's 500 million less straws that will end up in our environment in one day. So I really do um, believe that the impact of one person makes a big difference. Well, that's all the time we have. I would like to thank our guests for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you for thank having you. us. Thank you. Thank you for watching On Point. You can follow us on social media at CSUN On Point. You can hear us on KCSN 88.5 FM on Sunday mornings at 5.30. You can watch us on Santa Clarita Valley Television on Sundays at 5 and on LA 36 at 8 o'clock on Thursday nights. For all of us here at On Point, I'm Sofia Gutierrez.